So I'm going to introduce Summer first. And um, the session that him and Marie will formally introduce Marie a little later are going to go through will showcase the common concerns that journalists manage when talking about scientific research. So both Simmer and Marie have experience from two different dimensions, if you will, on um, this situation. So first, Simmer, who you've seen his um, bio, it's, it's very impressive. I want to point out that he won the uh, Eric and Wendy Schmidt Award for Excellence in Science Communication from the National Academies as a senior undergraduate student at Harvard while majoring in chemistry and the history of science. And so his background is not the traditional one that many of us have either had or come across in our experience. And so in, he's written, as I started to say, in both um, medical journals, scientific journals, and also in the lay press from the Atlantic, Time, Guardian, Washington Post, and also has spoke as, at NPR. So we heard about concerns of issues that we might not cover well. And now we're going to talk about how can we be effective in a communication on various issues. So Simmer, I'll turn it over to you now. So thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about what's important to making communication effective, speaking both as a a journalist, as a science journalist, um, but also as just a citizen of the world and uh, someone who is interested in research, who has a research background. And I think I want to give you a sense of a little bit of uh, my writing, my background. Um, I've written about animal research. Um, and let's see if we can get the slide to advance. Great. I wrote about animal research for The Guardian and Washington Post. Um, I've written for about it in Smithsonian Magazine and as well as Slate. Um, and really, these articles that focused on the pig heart transplant that happened a little bit over a little bit about two years ago at the University of Maryland, where they took a heart from a genetically modified pig and then uh, put it into a patient with end stage heart failure. So I've written for a number of outlets um, on really a similar topic. And I think it's taught me one thing, how do you communicate to different audiences? Slate, for example, uh, prefers a more humorous tone, so to say. Uh, the Guardian, I was writing a 4,000 word feature. So they really wanted me to get in depth, looking at the science, the history, and the ethics of xenotransplantation, as it's called. So what motivated my work was this interest in this this operation, of course, but also just the broader context. I think it, as a field, uh, as a research field, there's a tendency to hide the contributions of animals. This is true in research where a lot of animal research happens in these underground tunnels uh, in universities. At least that's what I've seen at Stanford, where I did some work. Um, but it's also in just the supermarket where you see a crisp uh, packet of bacon right under the self mm -hmm. wrap, and you don't ever get a sense of what the factory farming was to get it to your supermarket. So we have this notion both in our society and medical research specifically where animals are indispensable to our work yet they're simultaneously rendered invisible in the previous session we talked a little bit about that how we don't get the sense of that basic science that came before the covid vaccine for example the problem is this invisibility is getting harder and harder to sustain you have this issue where you're having zoonotic diseases like covid like zika like so many more where viruses and uh, other pathogens from animals are being transmitted to humans you have the fact that we have biomedical advances like xenotransplantation, where the transfer from animals to humans is meant to promote life, to promote well-being. So we're breaking down this animal to human barrier in a very visible way these days. Um, and that was the most clear with the xenotransplantation case. But what I saw was that everyone was talking about David Bennett, who was a patient who received the heart. There's very little discussion of the pig who came behind him, the pig whose heart uh, gave him life. So that's what motivated my work. And I want to talk a little bit about what my reporting process was like across these uh, several pieces. The first thing that I think is important to know is who am I talking to? For The Guardian, as I was mentioning, I was writing a 4,000-word feature, a long story. And I wanted to get a variety of different perspectives. I talked to scientists, the scientists at the University of Maryland who had done this operation. I also talked to social scientists, historians, ethicists who could put this operation within a larger context. I talked to PETA. I, I got their perspective as an animal rights group, their different perspective, of course. And also I talked to a heart surgeon who could help me understand what is all this animal research leading to? What are the clinical implications? I think that's something we often forget um, is that 
animal research is part of a continuum and there is a, there's stakes to it. There's a purpose to it. Um, and I wanted to get that perspective as well. So a wide variety of perspectives, cause I had a wide word count. And I think what's important is what was the most difficult part of my research? What was the most difficult part of my storytelling? It was really finding someone to tell me about the pigs. What was their life like? What, how were they raised? How were they genetically modified? Because it's something that's very sensitive. Uh, when I often I talk to people, they shut me down as soon as I ask a question about how the pig was raised, right? These were the scientists who were a part of this. I tried to get in contact with a company uh, who created these pigs. They never just wanted to <laughs> return my call. Um, but it is something where I eventually did get information. I did find out. And I think there's a couple lessons about that. I mean, in the screenshot on the slide, you see a little bit of what I wrote. Um, but there's the lesson that I think here is that a determined journalist, one way or the other, will find will get that information. The reality is a lot of this is in people's uh, research articles, right? In their methods, right? Because you have to offer writing that is reproducible. Your research has to be reproducible. It's going to be among your colleagues uh, who are more willing to talk, more free to talk. And frankly, it's going to become be among animal rights activists who, whether they know the full extent or not, they will offer their perspective. They will offer what they think happened. So I think what the point I want to make is that talking with the journalists, right? Uh, speaking about animal research, right? It of course carries its risks, but it also allows you to set the narrative the way you, you think it should be set, right? Mm -hmm. To offer what, you, what is the most accurate representation of how the animals are taken care of, of the protections that you are installing. Because if you don't talk, if you shut down, you say, I'm not gonna talk about this to the journalists, someone else will, and you don't know how accurate or not they will be. I think also I want to emphasize the importance of respect and empathy. This is, of course, good values for all of us. We should have all learned this when we were kids. Um, but it is something where think about the, both the perspectives. The journalist wants to get answers. They have questions. They want to get answers. And sometimes, uh, whether we like it or not, they want to get juicy quotes, so to say. They want to get quotes that stick out in an article that stick with people. The researcher, the scientist, they want to explain something. They want to explain their research, their work. Um, but they also want to avoid saying the wrong thing. I think we all have this natural, probably proper tendency uh, that we don't want to be misquoted. We don't want to be taken out of context. So these can be conflicting goals. These can be conflicting roles, uh, but there are also opportunities where these meet. For example, metaphors and similes go a long way, right? There is a way to give the journalist that juicy quote uh, without necessarily compromising your own work, without necessarily being taken out of context, right? So that's something where you can do some preparation. Thinking, how can I compare this for the journalist? How can I help the journalist uh, make sense of what's going on? Is there another way to think about this? Another thing scientists can do is often offer help, suggesting other sources, other people to interview, uh, sending other links. So um, links to research papers, links to statistics, be helpful so that the journalist gets it right. Because I think I, I want to talk a little bit about my approach, because I think that shapes a lot of how I try to approach this, re this respect and empathy. Oftentimes, I start off my interviews with more softball questions. Um, I want to seem more human, right? I don't want to seem like the journalist behind the email. I want to ask questions that are not too difficult um, that I still want to know the answers of. I still want quotes on. Uh, but helps me build trust. I'll often subtly encourage people uh, to telling them, oh, that really makes sense where you're coming from. Oh, I understand what you're saying, right? Uh, not because I'm trying to take one side or the other, but because I recognize that's important for someone to feel safe, to feel willing to continue to talk to me. Um, and then I will ask tough questions, right? Uh, any good interview, <laughs> interview needs tough questions, but those will often come in the middle. Because if I start with tough questions, that ultimately shuts down the conversation. So this is my method. Of course, every uh, journalist will have something different. Uh, but I think it gives you a perspective of when you are being interviewed by a journalist, right? Um, they're trying to build respect and empathy um, with you. And hopefully, you are trying to build respect and empathy with them. Um, this is a two-way street. Um, and it's important on a just, I mean, a practical moral sense, but also on a practical sense. Because how you communicate to the journalist, how helpful you are, how willing you are to just um, uh, be there for them, right? It will and sometimes shape how you're quoted, shape how you are put into the context, right? If I mean, I've had uh, scientists I've spoken with who've been very brusque, uh, very rude, frankly, uh, not very helpful. And then I, I might not even quote them in the piece because I don't get anything helpful. Um, and I'm sure there's some part of my unconscious bias where maybe I don't give them the full benefit of the doubt when I'm quoting them, right, versus someone else. So I think respect and empathy is a moral obligation, but also a practical one. And the reality is that sometimes journalists will get something wrong, right? It's, it's uh, the reality of the situation. Uh, so some, something people always want to know is what do you do in that case? And for that, I always offer four, four recommendations. Be kind, private, specific, and factual. The kindness is important because journalists put a lot of work into this. This is their profession, right? You want to respect and understand that. Um, private is important because I've had and seen uh, other people blast journalists on social media saying this journal, this was totally wrong, totally inaccurate, right? And that's not productive or conducive to getting the facts straight. Both the journalists and the scientists want to get the facts straight. 
I think the other part is being specific. Um, I've had emails where people have said, this is a horrible article. You, 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 you have, you're not qualified in any way or shape or form, um, but they don't tell me what I've done wrong or what I can correct or what I can fix, right? So that doesn't help me. And, it, and after back and forth, sometimes they have nothing to say specifically, right? Which is not helpful either. Um, and I think the last part is being factual, right? There will always be tension over subjective characterization. Oh, you use this word instead of that word, right? Um, it wasn't as extreme as this. Um, but what, where the questions are most impactful and worth making is when I've made a factual mistake, a journalist has made a factual mistake, and you can send a source that say, hey, actually, the number is this. Well, actually, the number you use is from this organization, this industry-funded organization. Here's a more objective statistic to put in this place. Um, I want to give an example of this. Uh, this is an email I got um, after the publication of my piece in The Guardian. Um, it's from the University of Maryland, and um, essentially... I mean, there's something we can learn from here. They start off very kind. Oh, we, uh, we appreciate your article. It was a good article. Um, they gave a sense of uh, what specific changes they wanted. They had these two, uh, this sentence, and they may, may very specifically said what it was. But I think there's a couple things we can also learn of why this wasn't the best way or approach to ask for these corrections. First off is sort of the questions they were asking. Um, they were questions of verbiage, questions of, oh, I don't like this word, right? Can you use this word, right? Um, and the second thing is they didn't offer any evidence or resources or support to say that this is not accurate, This is the other thing is accurate. They sort of said it by fiat that uh, we don't like this, uh, it's not accurate, change it. Um, so I think the point I want to make here is that this is not the kind of mistakes you want to correct, right? Because in many ways, they're not mistakes, right? The idea of gruesome, I had gone in a, from an interview, right? The doctor had told me that he had was slightly betting that it was uh, this part that killed the heart. So first off, I was correct in my way. They weren't offering any specific evidence. And more than that, the person who was sending this email was a PR person from the University of Maryland, right? Um, if you want to correct something and you want it to be a scientific correction rather than a public relations correction, it should come from the scientist, right? Um, because that adds legitimacy and depth to it. In a way here where it was very clear this person uh, want, didn't like how they sounded, right? How the university sounded, how the research sounded. So they're trying to change it. Um, so that's, I think, a key point, right? Journalists don't want to make public relations corrections because they're not working for the scientist. They're working for the public in many ways. So I want to now talk a little bit about, I've spoken a little bit about the relationship between the journalist and the scientist and the, that interview process. I also want to talk about what the public wants to know, right? And it's a difficult question to answer because animal research is something that's not been in the public domain for so long, right? That it's often been hidden and obscured, right? Uh, I, as we mentioned in the last session, right? Sometimes you'll have sort of a PETA-based or animal rights group-based uh, advocacy campaign or, or a public relations campaign, but there isn't much scientists openly and willingly talking about this. So what does the public want to know? And I'll offer some of my thoughts. What matters to people? What are they interested in? I think the first thing is that people care about history. They want to know about the past, right? Um, if not because they actually are history majors or whatnot, uh, but because they're interested in what they've heard. They're interested in what all the bad things that have happened in the past, the uh, experimentation, really, that's happened in the past. And I think that's a unique opportunity to acknowledge that, understand that, and then understand why the research of today is different from the experimentation of yesterday, right? Our, our past mistakes don't need to be repeated. So I think acknowledging that is important. In my pieces, I talked a lot about the experimentation, uh, or really with Baby Faye. Baby Faye was this 12-day-year-old uh, infant who received a walnut-sized baboon heart, um, I think in the 1980s, 1984, if I remember correctly. Um, and it was a widely panned operation after it happened. Baby Faye died shortly thereafter. It was called the Anything Goes um, School of Human Experimentation. Um, and in many ways, that was something that, for many people, that's what xenotransplantation reminds them of. They think about baby Faye. They think about the baboon who died to give her this heart when it was a useless, I mean, it was not going to work in any case, right? They didn't have effective immunosuppression. They hadn't done any gene editing, right? It was almost this like last ditch attempt uh, with no apparent use. Um, they think about baby Faye. They think about other histories where uh, you have this uh, scientist, Serge Vorneroff, who took testicles and uh, ovaries from baboons and uh, apes and put it into humans, trying to restore people's zest of life. So you see this, like, I mean, some fantastical, honestly, some silly experimentation in the past. And I think that's what we're doing today. So I think it's important to acknowledge that and help people give people a new memory, help them understand that the present can be different and present is different, right? We have more stringent regulations. We have different, um, different expectations and different values um, that we're enforcing more importantly. So history matters. Other part of it is that animal choice matters. Um, the choices that we use in um, 
in medical research and animal research, uh, they're not random, right? They're based on economics. They're based on the three R's. Um, they hold meaning and also limitations. I think explaining that to the public matters because it's not just that the pig was chosen for xenotransplantation just because. In fact, in my reporting, what we explored was why was why were pigs chosen for xenotransplantation? Why was it not monkeys or lamb or sheep or any, any other kind of animals? And the reality is there are, of course, um, aspects of like, oh, the pigs, pigs can grow to an appropriate size. Uh, they produce large litters uh, quick, quickly. All that is important for practical purposes. And there's also sort of the, the touchy subject that pigs are also not covered by the Animal Welfare Act. Um, and who knows what is the proper explanation for all these different factors. But the point I want to make is that um, there is a central tension in animal research where our animal models are expected to be close but not close enough, right? They need to be close so that they are actually actual models for humans, uh, but not close enough that it gives us pause. That's why primate research um, is so contentious. It's, that's too close. Uh, and why rat research and mice research is often uh, disregarded as, oh, that's too far away from uh, humans, right? We ha once you do small animal research, you have to graduate, so to say, to large animal research in order for uh, scientific discovery, scientific finding to be valid. So the question when you have this close but not close enough paradigm is that you get this sort of uh, model with limitations. It's not going to be a perfect representation, not going to be a perfect um, expectation. It's not, and it's not going to just solely be chosen by scientific factors. It's go it, by necessity, it's going to be chosen by practical, economic, social factors. Um, and I think acknowledging that is important uh, because I think the uh, world expects that, public expects that, they understand that. Um, but it also allows you to begin discussing the limits of animal models. We've seen the statistics that um, 90 or 95 percent of uh, drugs tested in animals fail, right? Um, and we need to openly discuss the fact that animal models are not perfect, even if they're necessary right now, because our, our other alternatives are not any are much better. So I think it's that nuance that I want to emphasize, and it's the nuance that comes with animal choice and why that matters. The final thing I'll mention is that the future matters. Um, animal research, as I mentioned, is part of a continuum. It is not this single point in time. Um, and you want to help, I, I wanted to help the public understand what did it mean that this, you had this end of one case study at the University of Maryland where this person got a big heart. What does that mean? What's the goal? What's the intention behind this operation? And there were a couple of things we focused on. Um, one of the things I mentioned was this idea of the tyranny of potential. This idea that uh, we risk seeing animals as these replacement parts, where we pull from them to extend human life, almost this endless pursuit of immortality. So that was something I wanted to consider. What does this philosophically mean? Right? What, what could it mean? What was that critique? There's also the critique of this idea that we'll need a whole new economy of factory farming. Uh, we have one already for pigs, but in order to raise them in sterile environments, in order to genetically engineer them and have them have their ex organs explanted for human use, right? That would require another economy. So these are things that are important to consider, if not only because what is our future looking like, right? Our future is not all good, uh, like sunshine and roses, right? Um, it also has these slightly darker parts. And only by acknowledging them and understanding the trade-offs are we going to actually create a sustainable model for research, sustainable model for translational research. And I think that's the question that people want to know. It's like, where are we going? What's the point of this? What, what are the stakes here? Um, and that is something that I want to emphasize especially, right? That what are the stakes? In this article, in my Guardian article, that's what I focused on, right? I, I talked about this idea of the tyranny of potential, this idea of factory farming. And then I also said that if my mom or dad, if my parents or loved ones, right, um, had end-stage heart failure, right, their lungs slowly filling with fluid, right, um, their likelihood of getting a heart off the donor list, un unlikely, right, I would take the pig heart. And I think many of us would too. And I think that's the, that's the thing that we often don't remember when we're thinking about this work is that animal research has these clinical implications, and we can emphasize that. We can make that clear. We can make that tangible, right? Um, and that doesn't forestall our ability to critique uh, methods, to seek for a better future, uh, seek for a better methodology and process, but it is sort of helps put things into perspective. And that nuance, I think, goes a long way for the public. Um, because the reality is, um, and I have no data, I'll start this saying I have no data to support this distribution, but it is something where just in my conversations and in my uh, talking, you get the sense that there are people on the extremes, right? You have people that, uh, literally a PETA spokesperson who told me pigs are people. And then you have people, uh, scientists who said, I mean, essentially that pigs are replacement parts. Neither of which I think uh, most of the population would endorse. Neither of which most of the population thinks is a reasonable thing. 
But because we've stopped talking about animal research, because we have scientists who, when I try to talk to them, ask them questions, they end the conversation as is. Um, because normal people aren't often asked, what do, you, what do you do about animal research? What do you think about this? Um, how do you want it to proceed forward? We don't have them involved as much as we could right, in our decision-making processes. You get this en endless polarization of the debate, where you have the loudest voices on either side shaping the conversation. Um, and it doesn't make it productive. It doesn't make it effectual. So my goal as a, a journalist is try to find that middle ground, right, to understand that, understand both sides, um, and then hopefully carve a path forward where you can understand how this xenotransplantation is perhaps not the best model, right? That you have these legitimate concerns, but it is a necessary one for our time being. Um, and I think that's sort of when we're thinking about making communication effective, I really truly want to advocate for scientists uh, to be more open, to be more um, transparent about this work, because I think if we don't have that, right, we're going to continue to uh, make these discussions more and more extreme. We're going to continue to struggle to even start these discussions for fear that we will be misquoted, for fear we will take it out of context. Um, and I think that we just being able to have these genuine conversations goes a long way, and it allows us to have a more uh, public, more understanding, empathetic discussion in the, in the media. So thank you very much for that opportunity to share a little bit of my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now, okay. Um, Is it on? And, um, Simmer and Marie are going to have a creative conversation that we'll, we'll watch. So Marie is uh, in her third year of lab residency at Laboratory Animal Science um, at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. Uh, she was an ASLAP, which is the American Society for Laboratory Animal Practitioners, for those who don't know the acronym, fellow at Emory. And she's worked with many different species, also in containment situations. So Marie, over to you. Thank you so much. And I just wanna first start off by saying, but I have a, a slight disclaimer um, that my presentation today is my views and mine alone and do not necessarily represent the views of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you. All right, so we've talked a lot about that scientists need to talk to people more. Um, and throughout my residency program, what I have gotten to do is talk with a lot of different groups about my role as a veterinarian and in my experiences of lab animal medicine. And what I'd like to share with you today are just some of the elements that I think make my conversations with the public go well. And some of these we've heard from our other speakers, um, which hopefully reiterates them. Um, but the elements that I think are crucial to these conversations are listening, context, empathy, and knowledge. So the first one, listening, that's not new to talking about effective communication. That's what anyone will tell you. But what does that mean in the sense of animals in their use and research? First, I think whenever we start to have a conversation with someone who has questions or concerns or maybe no knowledge of animals and research, take a moment to pause. Don't judge them because you don't want them to judge you. And then really listen to what their concern is. Are they concerned just with animals in research or perhaps their concerns are broader to animals in research, but also animals in the food chain and agriculture, maybe even animals as pets and animal abuse. If they are just concerned with research, is it all animals in research or just certain species like dogs and primates? Perhaps they've done a little bit of background reading and they're concerned about one particular type of research. Once you've identified what their main concern is, you can target your conversation to be more effective. Maybe you can even decide that what they're really concerned about, you're not prepared to discuss. Maybe it's not your area. And it's okay to say that. But really take the time to listen to who you want to talk with because you want to, them to listen to you. The next important element is context. And for me, context is twofold. It's the context of the person or group of people with whom you're discussing. 
and the context of the environment. So what does the context of a person mean to me? So the first thing that I can kind of tell when I'm talking with someone is, is this an open-minded person or a closed-minded person? I think, especially this time of year, we all get to practice this. When you go home for Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner, you sit down with your aunts, uncles, and cousins, and someone brings up one of those terrible topics of politics, religion, or where I'm from, sports. And you can tell pretty quickly how far this conversation is going to go. Is this going to be a good conversation or a bad one? And when I have a topic like the use of animals in research, which can be contentious, it's pretty easy to get a sense of how this conversation is going to go. So take a moment to read the room. The next element of context within a person that I tried to evaluate is what they already know. Do they know anything about animal research? Do they have ideas that are maybe based in media or movies? Are these ideas true or not? Perhaps they worked in an animal facility and maybe theirs is similar to what you do as a scientist or maybe it's really different. So try to get a sense of their background knowledge. The last thing is try to understand if the person has any affiliation. This can be obvious, such as if they're with an animal rights organization. Maybe it's a student group at a university, or perhaps it's just someone you're meeting for the first time and they don't have any affiliation and they're just curious. When I talk to a group of veterinary students, it's very different than how I talk to my cousins at dinner table over Thanksgiving about what I do for my job. I think veterinary students enjoy all the scientific jargon. They find it really invigorating and it convinces them that there's some high level thinking going on in what we do and I'm trying to convince them to come join me. But when I'm talking with my family about this, I change the language because I want it to reach them. Context for me also means the environment. And while there is certainly a time and place to have these kind of discussions, my most important factor in context of the environment is time. I know we've all talked about the attention span that people have, but sometimes it really is just the opportunity. An elevator pitch can be just that. You are in an elevator and you only have 30 seconds, a minute, maybe two. Perhaps you have a captive audience and you have a whole hour. <laughs> For me, I would rather give statements that are perhaps more broad and accurate than risk painting a half painted picture that leaves them with more questions and answers, but I just don't have time to answer them. So for me, understanding just how much time I have to explain myself is a good way to set me up for success in these conversations. The next element that I really want scientists to embrace is one that perhaps they're not used to doing, especially in terms of discussing science, and that's empathy. We tend to take emotion out of science. It's certainly not in any of our scientific papers that we're so used to writing. A lot of scientists don't take time or don't think to develop emotional connections with their animals, or maybe they don't want to because it means you have to be vulnerable. But I really encourage you to do so, and I, I personally do not believe it will compromise your science. It will make your science better, and as a veterinarian, it makes my care of these animals better. It helps me to relate to my animal caretakers and help everyone feel as though we are making meaningful, impactful research. Once you develop that empathy, you can then communicate with those who have concerns with the use of animals in research, because that empathy gives you common ground. You're concerned with animal welfare, and so are they. That common ground will set you up for a productive conversation. The last element that I think can really move our conversations about animals and science forward is knowledge. This is the one that requires the most legwork. Scientists are, of course, knowledgeable about their own studies and all of the background that goes into it. But I really encourage scientists to educate themselves on all that goes into being possible, like having animals possible as a model, not just what's the best model, but what are the legal requirements that we have to have to be able to do experiments that involve animals? I think that the legal requirements are sort of my favorite argument for talking with people to convince them that welfare and good veterinary care and enrichment are present, not just because I want it or maybe because I work for a good facility, but I know that lots of facilities have all of these elements of good care and welfare for their animals because they're legally required and they get audited. And I think that that can bring a lot of comfort to the public, knowing that it's not at the whim of an individual or the kind heartedness of one organization. It's legally required. And there are international standards that facilities try to meet or go above and beyond those standards. I think that'll bring a lot of comfort to the public, but scientists need to be aware of those. 
We have our institutional animal care and use committees that review and ask for changes in all protocols. But does the public know that there has to be a community member on those committees, their voice is represented in that individual. That's something that when I talk to people that they are surprised at, and I'll tell you that I've had someone join an IACUC because she learned about this and now she gets to be that community member and her voice directly has that impact. Make sure your public knows that. Another thing that I think is really cool within science is that we care about welfare so much that we fund research just to make our own animals more comfortable. We are constantly seeking out better pain medicine, better enrichment, lower stress handling techniques for the animals that we use within experimentation. And we, are, we care about it so much that we'll fund it. We spend all this time on it. Your grad students are pulling their hair out about it. Um, and it's valuable to us. And we, we, we put such a value on it because we care about welfare. Lastly, scientists, please communicate your why to the public. What is your big picture? What has inspired you to do this, this science? Um, what are the people that you hope to help through your use of animals in research? Talk to them about how you created your protocol. How did you replace, reduce, and refine your use of animals? And what is your end goal? So in conclusion, talking to the public about the use of animals in research certainly takes patience and it takes preparation. But with these elements, I think that you'll find that your conversations are productive. Thank you. All right. I believe you two have a set of questions you're going to go through and, um, and then we'll come back. Okay, go ahead. Wonderful. Uh, so the situation we're going to be taking today is one that I imagine will be familiar for many people as they're traveling for the holidays. Uh, we are in a long TSA line, um, and I just happen to be behind Marie. Uh, I'm a member of the public. Marie is uh, in her role um, as a veterinarian with the CDC. And I just want to know a little bit what she's doing, because I have nothing better to do in this long security line. So Marie, or I guess I don't know your name at this point, but hey there, you there. <laughs> well, what, do you, uh, what do you do? I mean, we're going to be in this line forever, so I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, so I'm a veterinarian, actually, and I work at Great Science University as a veterinarian. Oh, that's really interesting. Do you take care of the animals uh, when they get injured? you go and help them? You know, although I was trained in vet school to do things like work on cats and dogs mm -hmm. and cows and horses, um, I actually work on animals and research right now. Animals and research. So uh, what, you're doing the research on them? So as a veterinarian, um, I'm not directly doing the research, but I support my scientists and I make sure that the animals on research protocols get adequate care are an, and are as happy and healthy as possible. Happy and healthy. I mean, don't these, I mean, what I've heard is that these animals die at the end of their, I mean, uh, end of their like research thing. So they get euthanized. So how, how will they be happy and healthy? So a few things. Um, first of all, not all animal studies end in euthanasia. Um, in fact, I, I love my stories of success where a lot of research animals can get adopted out at the end of studies. And I know people that have these animals um, that they live long, happy lives in their homes with. But it is true that a lot of studies require all the tissues of an animal to answer mm -hmm. all their questions. And that does end in euthanasia. This means they're not being wasteful though. They're answering all the questions that they need to by using the whole animal. But I mean, you're a veterinarian, you're supposed to help animals, right? How are you then euthanizing animals and feeling good about yourself? <laughs> that, that's a great question and I get that a lot. Um, but for me, I get to be their advocate, their voice. I get to make sure that all their time on study, they have the best care possible and that they're as comfortable as possible. And for me, euthanasia, it means good death. And I get to make sure their death is as smooth and as painless as possible. But these animals didn't choose to die. They, they didn't choose to be in this research. So I mean, aren't you just making yourself feel better? <laughs> well, not only am I, uh, I love my animals, first of all, mm. um, but knowing that they're ethically taken care of because they're my research heroes is really important to me. It's also legally required, which I think is, is really important for the community to know that this is a value we all hold in the science field is that these animals should be so protected that we have laws about it. And in the end, I'm trying to protect people too. Mm. So as a veterinarian, I wanna make sure that the products like drugs or medical devices that we test in people are safe. What I've heard, though, is that a lot of these drugs, they just, I mean, the animals just don't work, right? I mean, a rat is not a human. So, like, you test, you, you can test your uh, drugs in rats, right? And then you can kill them afterward. Uh, but then if it doesn't make the humans, aren't you just wasting these animals' lives? I think that... 
you bring up an important point and my favorite analogy is you know think about how many tries it took to get to a light bulb is we have all of these scientific queries and a lot of them end in dead ends but when it finally does work it can change the world and i certainly want to wouldn't want to put the risk of a person in harm's way by not knowing what a drug does mm -hmm. I mean, you have also talked about these these regulations. I mean, can you tell me a little bit more about like what you're what you're required to do? Yeah, so we're required to do a lot, actually. We have internal inspections, external inspections, surprise inspections, <laughs> reporting. So I spend a lot of my time making sure that we're following all the rules. So you follow the rules just so that you don't fail an inspection? No, oh, I can understand how it would come across that way, but I want to make sure that my animals are taken care of because I care for them and everyone on my team does too. But following the regulations also means my science is good because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, healthy, happy animals leads to good science too. But I mean, you have these animals in cages, like how are they going to be healthy and happy, right? They're just stuck in a cage. They can't move. They can't go out and be free. So so the cages are bigger than you think, first of all, um, and we certainly have minimum space requirements that we always try to exceed, mm -hmm. and we try to make their environment as fun as possible. Um, I'll give you an example. I was working with some animals, and they had all of these fruits and vegetables that they get every day, and I had been looking for fresh figs for weeks to make in a recipe and I couldn't find them in any grocery store. And I went into my facility and I found my animals eating them. So they were literally eating better than I could. <laughs> That's interesting, but I mean, you, you're at you're at this uh, prestigious university. I mean, you can you I'm sure you can afford these nice figs, big big cages. Um, but I mean, think about it, right? Most places are not going to be like that. I mean, think about like I mean, Elon Musk, Neuralink's uh, experiments, right? You, you hear all these bad examples, and then you're telling me that you're a good person. Okay, fine, you're a good person, but how about all the bad things that I'm hearing? Well, I can't speak to every facility, but I know that facilities have accreditation and audits from even the government. Mm -hmm. So these audits make sure that they're following the rules too. But I certainly can't speak to facilities that aren't mine. Yeah, but I mean, I just I just see these things in the news and I just get so mad, right? I mean, they're killing these animals unnecessarily, right? And then you're telling me, again, you're, I believe you, you're a good person. <laughs> but how, how does that help, right? If, if you're the 1% and the rest of the people are just blatantly disregarding the rules, right? I think it's the opposite. I think the, the rule breakers are the 1% and what we don't see represented in the media are people who do follow the rules, who are treating their animals with respect and dignity while making good science. I really encourage you to dig further in that because it's a boring media story. <laughs> no, I mean, th this all is interesting, but I, I, I still am having trouble squaring away the idea that you're caring for these animals, they're under all this stress, right? And then you expect it to be good science. Yeah, we try to make it as least stressful as possible, and we're constantly making improvements to decrease that stress. We have whole research studies just mm. to see what their stress levels are and how we can improve that. So we're not perfect, but we certainly strive to do better every single day. And then what do you think we should do about these bad actors, right? I mean, this like, I mean, these Neuralink studies, these other studies where, I mean, they're just doing these horrible things. I mean, again, like there'll be good people, bad people, but the bad people are, are giving your field the name. That's what they're, that's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm reading. Well, I certainly can't control how many bad seeds there are in the world, but what I think is important is that we have those regulatory agencies that do those checks to make sure that mm -hmm. those bad seeds don't <laughs> keep doing their work in the way that they're doing. All right. Do you think the regulations should be stronger? I can't really say that. Um, I think that a lot of facilities that I've been in try to go above and beyond that. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. I think that might be a good stopping point uh, for this discussion. I, I gave Marie a hard time, but <laughs> hopefully not too bad. And I think there's uh, some things that we can learn from, uh, learn from that discussion. Uh, just to get us started, I think something that Marie did really well is uh, really bringing in the anecdote, bringing in the personal experiences. I mean, the story about the figs, right? I mean, whether that's re representative or not is almost irrelevant um, in some ways because it's something that will stick with me. It's something that I will remember for, I mean, frankly, many months after this conversation, right? Um, it's evocative. It's something that, I mean, many ways I, I'd recommend, like all scientists have, right? A story that they can pull on, an anecdote, right? Because that we're, we're creatures of stories and those stick in our mind. Yeah, like get to know your animals. Um, I've talked to so many researchers. Um, they absolutely play favorites, just like parents pick a favorite child, don't lie. Um, and they have a favorite animal and they have a story about it, or they end up adopting that animal after the study, or they have those success stories. So please do keep those in your back pocket. I love that idea. The other thing that I think some, uh, I want to note is really like uh, the question that I was asking Marie about like Neuralink and other 
bad actors, bad apples, as so to say. Um, because the reality is that is what people remember. That is what people paint the field as, right? Because again, it's not a good media story, right? If everything goes well, animals are like properly taken care of, all the regulations are followed, right? Nobody covers that because it's just not a story, right? They cover the, um, I mean, uh, who knows what the prevalence is, but they cover the one out of 100 uh, where things didn't go right, where the regulations were broken. Um, so what does that mean? That means for, I think for many people, you have to be well-versed in what happened, right? Because people will ask you about it, right? And it's, it, I mean, it's how, you should be say that, oh, you know, as Marie said, I don't know what happened in that facility, right? I can't speak for that. That's not my expertise. But here's what I do know, right? Um, because again, a non-answer, right? Shutting down a conversation doesn't show empathy. It doesn't show that you're understanding someone's perspective, right? It just makes them frustrated and angry and think you're hiding something. Um, even if you have no right to know what it is, I think it is important for people to stay abreast of what the field is, what the media yeah, same, because uh, that's what people are going to respond to. That's what people are going to ask about. Okay, we, we have a few questions yeah. that have come through. So I'll read the first one. Um, in contra and this one, it says for Simmer, but either of you could comment. In contrast to representatives from animal rights groups, scientists are not hired to advocate for the existence of their work. Instead, they rely on others, such as the university PR professional, to help communicate and advocate for their responsibility uh, for their work. While I'm not entirely absolving scientists of responsibility to learn some basic communication skills, why do you see the responsibility for communication falling on the shoulders of scientists instead of allowing their institutions to help them navigate and refine these communications? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think it has to be a partnership, right? I mean, PR officials, I, I didn't mean to paint them in a wholly negative light in my presentation. Uh, they have their place and they, they're, they are very helpful. For, for one, for example, helping me facilitate interviews with scientists, um, helping me answer questions afterward. Um, I, I think it does have to be a partnership, though, because the PR officials, for all their merits, they don't know the science like the scientists do, right? They don't have that authority, right, that a journalist seeks and craves, right? Uh, for a PR official, right, it's more of a facilitator role rather than an authority. A, a position of authority. So it ends up being where scientists should uh, play a role and they, and they should communicate. I think we all need scientists who are better versed at speaking to the media, better versed at communicating their research, um, and PR officials who can help facilitate that, who can help teach them their skills, offer their skills to the scientists, right? And it's this partnership. But what I, what I struggle with is when um, that ground is entirely ceded to PR officials, where the PR officials will do the interview, they'll send resources and all that. Um, and then my only interaction with the scientist is in like that uh, 15 minute Zoom interview. That's what frustrates me personally, because I want to, yeah, I want to hear from their mouth. And to add to that, for scientists, you know, your communication isn't going to just be formal. I think that those informal communications, when you're talking with yeah. students, your family, your friends, you can create a whole culture shift through that. Your communication is not just going to be in a formal university or organization setting. You're going to want to talk about your work to anyone if you're passionate enough about it. Yeah, good points. I just want to remind people um, as I go through these questions, if you're here and you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand on the program here. Okay, the next question I have, <clears throat> the person writes, I've seen colleagues struggling with interviews with journalists because they are afraid of saying something that is not scientifically correct. At the same time, I see how the journalist is trying to get some information that may be more interesting for the audience and that is not too technical. I would like to know, what would you suggest to do in that situation as a scientist? How can you find a compromise? Yeah, it's the perennial struggle between scientists and journalists, journalists who are trying to make things accessible, make things interesting for the reader, and the scientists who are trying to communicate their work in the fullest complexity possible, uh, because that's the, the nuance is important, the complexity is important. Uh, so there is always going to be a balance, and I think it takes uh, some negotiation of sorts, um, because for scientists, you cannot expect to have editorial access over the journalist's work, over what is written. Right? That simply goes against the journalistic code of ethics. Um, what you can hope for and ask for is an opportunity to fact check, opportunity to review passages. Oftentimes, this will have to be done verbally. Um, most many journalists will not send it, uh, send exactly the words they're going to uh, write uh, over email. But it's something where you should ask for and request and make sure that uh, try to do and make the time to do, um, because it is that shared interest of getting things right. Right, the words may change, the subjective words might change. Right, you might say gruesome instead of striking, for example. Right, but. The point and the message and the facts and should be stay the same, right? And I think everyone has a shared goal for that. Um, so it is really asking for that factoring call, right? Offering yourself willing to review any passages if that's desired, um, without an expectation that the journalists will do that, because again, they're not working for you. 
Lori, anything to add? No, I don't have anything to add. I think you covered it. Okay. Uh, Alice has a question. Thanks. This is for both Marie and Simmer. Um, you both mentioned the importance of empathy um, and learning um, that, that you will not get through to the people you're communicating with if you don't show empathy. Um, so my question is, what can you give us examples of what you might have learned from them um, in your conversations, in your communicating? Because for it to be truly empathetic and truly effective, um, we need to expect to learn from the people we're communicating with. Yeah, so especially talking with veterinarians, we are incredibly empathetic towards our patients and we want to be their biggest advocates. So some of the people that I find um, to be most emotional when talking about this are people who see the very worst of animals. And that, that tends to be shelter veterinarians or people who work in shelters. And they do see the worst and they don't want the worst for other animals. So I think that that can be a huge fear for people who, who see such bad situations that that's happening in some sort of way to other animals. So what I have learned is that I, I can really take the experience of my colleagues and everyone who works in perhaps animal abuse or abandonment um, and really learn that this is a high priority for them and that I can strive every day to do the best by my animals. Um, and they really push me forward in that as well. I mean, in many ways, journalism is just professional empathy of sorts, right? You're talking to people from a wide variety of perspectives, getting their thoughts and, and experiences. And I mean, as a journalist, my goal and is not to uh, take a, a specific side, right? Um, that would be counter to my uh, counter to my work, counter to my ethics, um, but to understand where people are coming from. And I think the conversation with the spokesperson from PETA uh, for my uh, work in The Guardian, um, this idea that pigs are people, right? Um, it's something where, like, it's not something I personally agree with, right? But the, clearly, this person did believe it, right? And I think that's something that we often uh, we don't we don't take for granted. We take for granted, right? That these uh, some people do really believe what they're saying, right? They do really believe that pigs are people, that animals like deserve to have the same moral standing as humans. And whether you agree with that or not doesn't preclude the fact that you have to have respect their perspective and understand how that plays into your work. Um, th that just because you don't like that, it won't go away, right? Just because you don't like that perspective, um, it's not gonna be rendered invisible. Um, so I think it really is understanding um, people's perspectives, understanding how they might not be, they might not mesh with yours, um, but how can you tell the story with nuance? How can you tell the story uh, with balance? <clears throat> okay, uh, Bill, then I'll go back to this question. So we've been focusing on communications in good times when we're telling a good story, but sometimes we have to tell a story in bad times where you've been challenged, where there has been a citation against a university by the government. Something's gone wrong because things can go wrong. And how does that change the communication strategy? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that when we find things that go wrong, um, I know that whenever something doesn't go right for me, whether it's professionally or, you know, maybe even in sports or something, it's an opportunity to do better next time. And it, it drives me forward to push and strive to be even better. And I think with citations, you know, there are revisits that inspectors will have. So you miss something on this inspection and you need to do better and we'll be back in a couple of weeks. And it's an opportunity to improve and to learn and to educate your staff and to create an institutional knowledge of this happened once and we're going to make sure it never happens again. Um, and so, although unfortunate events do happen, they are truly learning opportunities. And what we need to effectively communicate is what we are doing to improve ourselves and to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And that needs to be the focus of our conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We had a, a, a um, help sent out from a communication professional, and they say scientists are the best advocates for their own work, which I think everybody agrees with. And professional communications professionals can help you work out what you want to say and how to get it across to a lay audience. And I think you've had experience with this, or you maybe want to make a comment on it. Yeah, I mean, I think the reality is that uh, a scientist or anyone for that matter before an interview should prepare for that interview. Um, they should think about what are likely questions to ask. What are the things that I want to make sure get across? Um, oftentimes, you can ask the journalist, uh, what 
Um, you might not be able to ask them what questions specifically they're going to ask. Many are uh, going to are not going to want to share that per se. But you can ask them what topics do you expect to cover? What uh, arenas do you want to ask about? Um, so you can develop those metaphors and similes. You can develop like how can I take this super complex topic and distill it down to the most important parts. Most important is key because you're not going to be able to get everything in. So I think it is sort of the working with a communication specialist is important. It's an important part of that special, uh, a part of that preparation. Uh, if you don't have a communication specialist handy, that's not the end all be all. Um, but it is something where uh, you want to think: what is your message? What is your thesis, so to say? Right? It's like it's very much like an essay, right? You are communicating an idea, an argument, um, and you have a limited time period to do that, whether it's fifteen minutes or thirty minutes. Okay. Um, any questions from the room? Okay, this isn't a formal question, but I did want to make a comment, Marie can maybe comment on it, just a point of clarification, being the scientists and veterinarians that we are, that um, when pigs are used in medical research, they are covered right. by the Animal Welfare Act. And so your article, you know, right. had a, a different, could have got a different point across. So uh, for the sake of completeness, I did want to make that comment. Uh, I think there's a question or comment coming up from Joe. Um, since we have the opportunity of such young individuals that are passionate about this, uh, this topic um, and communicating and animal research, any advice or uh, uh, programs for educating or communicating to younger generations, even than yourself? <laughs> <laughs> So I get to talk to veterinary students all the time, and that's it's such a, a great opportunity um, to remind them that it is the coolest part of veterinary medicine, and they should come join us. Um, but for me, it, it gives me an opportunity to talk with my peers and um, to really listen to their concerns because especially in the, in the last 20 years, we've seen such an acceleration of science, and it's, it's faster than ever before. We made a vaccine in one and a half plus 45 years. Um, and... So for me, I can relate with them in the scientific discoveries that they've seen within that time. And I think that that's really important. Um, I think that talking with students even younger than, than grad students or even university students, I like to remind them that when I'm working with animals, I care for them so much. And I try to make sure that they're taken as good of care as possible and focusing on the things that matter to them, like what would matter to them if they owned cats or dogs. And I think that that's what sticks with them. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big believer of taking every opportunity you can get to talk to people about your work, about your research, if only because, especially like when you're like, for example, let's say you're lecturing um, in a sixth grade classroom, um, it's an opportunity to really present your work in it, all of its nuances, right? Some things that you might not have a chance to do when you're talking to a journalist or on a broadcast television. Um, so it is really an opportunity to, uh, to share that nuance, to speak openly about this, because I really do think we need a culture shift um, in, in research and in science where we're more open about discussing the promises and pitfalls of our models. Um, and we're able to navigate that line where we don't leave the space and the, and the void for the most extreme voices on either side, um, because it is something that's very contentious. That's part of the reason why this workshop is held. Um, but there's an opportunity for younger generations specifically who have that open mind, who are more willing to learn, right, to tell them not just the party line, the, talk, the talking points, right, but really the struggles that you have, right, the struggles and then the balance you strike with your work. I don't have another question, but I'm going to make a comment or a question. So I have two daughters in their 20s, and they're once out of university, one's in university. And I also taught veterinary ethics to third-year vet students at Penn this past September. And I see the younger people struggling with things that uh, we had different things to struggle about. Okay, I'll just put it that that way. So one question that came up is what I thought. Did I think it was ethical for people to go into debt to take care of their pets? Mm -hmm. And I was sort of stunned by the question because I, you know, my first response was, well, you shouldn't, I didn't say this, but I'm thinking well, we shouldn't go into debt, take care of your pets. And then I thought, well, is that elitist, you know, so only rich people could have pets because then the people who couldn't afford to have pets. And then I thought about my first pet and who got puppy shots and that was it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> had him for 16 years and we never went back to the vet. Um, I didn't have the background that you did. I came to veterinary medicine in a different way. So, um, you know, Joe's question about the, the different world that we exist in now, both from the polarization to the um, um, almost, 
uh, the terrible burden I think a lot of kids are carrying because of the way things are going in the world and the way things are going with social media and what they're seeing and hearing. Any advice uh, would be most welcome. Um, well, to the finances for your own personal pet, you know, I think that that's a choice that owners make on their own behalf. Um, and they do have that freedom to choose because they are owned privately. And, and that's one of the biggest differences about using animals in research is that um, my animals are not privately owned that I work with. And the choices are made um, with a whole panel of a whole IACUC panel. And, and that's, that's another luxury that we have is that it's a collective decision. And I think it's, it's easier that way. It doesn't, it's not weighing on the burden of one person. And that's what's so great about the use of animals and research is that there are a checks and balances going into it. And, and I hope the public knows that, that we don't make decisions lightly, just like an owner trying to decide whether or not to spend 10 grand on a dog, um, because it is that expensive. Um, in, when 10 grand is actually a small amount in terms of science, um, but we don't take any amount of money lightly. And I, th I think that that's something that we should, we should recognize. Okay. Uh, well, I don't have. Sorry. I don't have any other questions uh, from the uh, external audience. Uh, Adam. Um, so I was thinking about this concept of empathy, and <clears throat> so even if you know you think you do an experiment on a certain number of animals, and you believe that it's ultimately like a really positive thing because it results in this great amount of progress. Um, you might still, you know, have from this empathetic perspective say, well, even if it's good overall, I still feel bad for, you know, the animals that are in this experiment. And I guess what I'm wondering is that to me, it seems like there's a little bit of a tension between when you're communicating on the one hand, trying to frame things in a way where you minimize the chance of anyone walking away with any like negative view, at all, negative thought at all on the one hand, and on the other hand, like taking really seriously this empathetic reaction, the fact that, oh, this is like a sad thing, something that I should acknowledge <clears throat> as like something that's, you know, worth caring about. Um, and so I guess I'm just curious, do you guys see this as a legitimate tension? And how do you navigate that? Um, do you think there's always some sort of right answer of which, you know, whether you should be trying to minimize um, people walking away with a negative impression or, uh, you know, taking seriously the suffering or the, or whatever harms might result from it. So, yeah. That's a great question. And um, I see compassion fatigue in veterinary medicine all the time. And I certainly see compassion fatigue in lab animal medicine because death and euthanasia is a part of our daily work. Um, and we're so fortunate to really be coming into a societal culture that recognizes compassion fatigue when so many years we did spend minimizing it. And I hope we don't minimize it, but we really leave space for that, for that emotion, for us to process that and to give ourselves time and space as we need it. I've seen so many different facilities giving compassion fatigue training to their employees. And I think that's something everyone should be doing. And, and veterinarians certainly experience that because of the nature of our work. But I think anyone who works with animals in research should do that as well. So um, when people ask me, is it hard? I say, yes, it is hard. But to me, it's worth it. And knowing I gave them the best care possible during their life is the most important thing to me. So not minimizing, but recognizing and giving space for it, I think, is the most appropriate course of action. I mean, in many ways, this is the age old question between utilitarianism and deontology, so to say. I mean, the idea that, I mean, you can understand the stakes and sort of the purpose of your work, right? The reason why, um, in, in the end, right, it's worth it. I will still having um, these doubts or at least these regrets over the process um, and still see the process as necessary. Um, I think those emotions and those feelings are obviously compatible. And I think it's important in some ways to communicate that, right? Because, I mean, the, the stereotype of the cold scientist, right, has come, has come from someplace, right? It's this idea of just communicating about work without emotion, without realization, without um, sort of that understanding and compassion. Um, and I think there is an opportunity to give people new memories, to uh, explain things uh, in their complexity. Um, you can still leave people on where you've left yourself, right? As, as if you are doing animal research, you obviously come to the conclusion personally that it's worth it. 
as Marie was saying. Um, and you can leave people with that uh, realization as well, right? That I do, it is unfortunate that uh, animals might have to be euthanized for this purpose, um, but here's why I do it. Here's why it matters to me. I think bringing it back to the personal is always an effective uh, method because it's something that nobody can negate. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, incredible discussion and we're right on time uh, to switch to our next topic. And so thank you.